The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Look, I am going to send my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord, make his paths straight. And so it was that John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. All Judea and all the people of Jerusalem made their way to him, and as they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, they confessed their sins. John wore a garment of camel skin, and he lived on locusts and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, he said, Someone is following me, someone who is more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, we are celebrating the second Sunday of Advent. Now, I think last week I already mentioned that the word Advent means uh, someone is coming, uh, something that is coming. Yeah? And we are preparing ourselves for actually the second coming of Christ. Correct or not? So of course, Advent we might associate first with Christmas, but in actual fact, that is the first coming. And yes, we are also preparing ourselves to commemorate that first coming uh, of the Messiah, the Son of God, born in Bethlehem. But also, we are longing for His return, the so-called the Day of the Lord. Yeah? And that was what the second reading was trying to address. Because in actual fact, the early Christians, they thought that after Christ had ascended into heaven, it would only be a very short time before He came again. And He brought about the new heavens and the new earth. And that was what they were looking forward to. So they were very focused on living a very holy life, preparing for that final day. But... One year passed, two years passed, five years passed, ten years passed, fifteen years passed, twenty years passed, thirty years passed, and they were kind of left perplexed. Why has the Lord not yet come again? So that's why you have the second reading where there's an explanation given that maybe what is one day might actually be a thousand years for the Lord. What is a thousand years might actually be a day. And more than that, there is an explanation as to why there is a delay in the second coming of Christ. And did you all catch what that explanation was? The reason given by St. Peter was that God is being patient with us. He is giving a chance for everybody to be saved. Yeah, giving time for everybody to repent of their sins, to come to know God and to be ready to receive eternal life, yeah? to enter into the new heavens and the new earth. So that is the reason that we have in the scriptures, that God is actually being patient and He desires that everyone should be saved. That's why He gives us more time. Okay, so this is in the context of the second coming of Christ. All right, now 2,000 years have passed already, still He has not come. And still, we are having Advent every year and we are praying for Him to come again, the second coming. But I think I might have told you all last week, right? If He does come again, then uh, that's the end of your retirement plan, your whatever plans for holidays, wherever, your, oh, all your career plans, your, everything comes to an end, you know. <laughs> so are we really earnestly praying for the new heavens and the new earth? The end to all things? Hmm, I think some days or so, I'm a bit afraid to pray for the end. <laughs> because we are all clinging to life still, right? 
And worse still, or better still, if we are happy and we are enjoying ourselves, we wish it would continue forever and ever. So, I think uh, this aspect of Advent, sometimes we would rather just sweep it under the carpet and think that Advent is all just about remembering the birth of Christ. Okay, but it's also normal in us human beings to be desiring for a continuation of the present happiness that we are experiencing. And that is why we also desire eternal life, which is the promise of eternal happiness in God, of course, not on this earth, but in heaven. And so that's why also maybe we are drawn to that promise, you know, that in Christ we have eternal life. Okay, anyway, whatever it is, whether we are longing for the end of the world or not, whether we are longing for the coming of Christ or not, as the second reading says, it will come, that day will come like a thief. So in fact, we do not know when, we do not know exactly how, but when it comes, it comes. So there's no stopping it from happening. And whatever it is, we must be ready. That's the point. We have to be ready to meet our maker. And whatever it is, our life will come to an end. Even if the world still continues, we have to be ready for our own last day when we will meet God face to face. So every Advent or so, even if we can't think of this second coming of Christ and the end of everything as we know it and the new heavens and the new earth, at least we should take our Advent preparation seriously knowing that our own end could come at any time. Now yesterday I was driving towards Palm Mall. I almost also had the end of my life. I was on the right lane driving, you know, the Lingkaran Tengah Road, the so-called Ring Road, right? And uh, of course, when you're on the right lane, you're passing all the slower traffic on the left lane, isn't it? You're passing, passing. There's nothing you can do about it. You're just passing them. All of a sudden, one of these vehicles cut out into my car. <laughs> I suppose I was at that moment in the blind spot. So the person did not realize. So I had the emergency brake. Everything in my car that was at the back all flew to the front. I almost died. In actual fact. Oh, but I'm still standing here. So for those of you who were hoping not to see Father Cat, that he's still around. <laughs> yeah, so it can be scary. And actually, this is not the first time. You know? And I'm sure you may have experienced this also. But of course, we continue. Maybe at that particular moment, we are a bit shaken. Immediately, I cut to the left lane. And I was thinking, hmm, I think I should drive back home today. <laughs> But no, I continued on my journey, and that's what we all do. We continue on our journey. We can't be living just in fear of the end all the time either, right? And yes, things happen. Medical issues happen. Accidents on the road happen. All kinds of things happen. And people, one moment they are fine, next moment they cannot breathe. In the evening, they have passed on already. It happens. So always we must be ready. Ready to meet our Lord. Yeah? And so... One of the ways as Catholics we want to be ready is we repent of our sins and we confess our sins and we seek God's forgiveness, right? So we make our peace with God. So that's an important preparation that we do at least twice a year during Lent and Advent. Yeah? And so it is a good thing that we come and confess our sins. Let us not be burdened by our sins and let us always be ready to meet our maker, yeah? Okay, so now, you all know, uh, Monday the penitential service is happening, right? 7, 7.30, I can't remember. What's it? 7, huh? Okay, so I hope you all will come for that. And now let me just say a few words about confession, yeah? And in fact, today's gospel talks about the forgiveness of sins. This is one of the helps that God gives us to help us to prepare ourselves to be in union with Him. And it is a great gift, the fact that we can be forgiven. You know what a great burden it would be if every sin we committed could not be forgiven? Could you imagine such a thing? If every wrong that you did would be held against you, such that you have no, and you don't have even a second chance. So this forgiveness of sin that God offers to us, thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ, is really a great gift. And that is God's way of consoling us, His people, in this valley of tears. He helps us in our journey and He gives us this possibility 
to repent and to confess our sins and to be forgiven. And being forgiven, really, it really frees us from a lot of burdens, from guilt, and it gives us opportunity to move on in our life. Now, for us who are Catholics, we have the sacrament of reconciliation, where we come and we confess to a priest, right? And some people will ask, you know, why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Actually, first of all, nobody says that you need to. In fact, you can confess directly to God. Yes, nothing prevents you from doing that. Every Mass we are doing that, I confess to Almighty God, to you, my dear brothers and sisters, blah, 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 blah. Right or not? You can confess your sins directly to God. At this very moment, if Holy Spirit is moving your heart to repentance, at this very moment, you can confess your sins to God. And He will forgive you if you are sincere. And it is the movement of the Holy Spirit that is making you confess directly to our Lord. There's no problem with that. But what is the advantage of the sacrament? Why did Jesus institute this sacrament? You know Jesus instituted this sacrament, right? One of the Easter readings we will see, he, after his resurrection, huh, he will breathe upon the apostles and he will say, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. Right? So he gives the power of forgiving the sins to the apostles. Right? So Christ instituted this sacrament. Now what is the advantage of it over uh, just confessing directly to God? Okay? And it is this. When you confess directly to God, unless you have some special communication line with God, where you dial a number, He picks up the phone and He talks to you, you are not going to hear the words that you are forgiven. And you'll be left with a doubt, are you? Was I really sorry or not that day? Did I really receive God's forgiveness or not? You might doubt, you know. And then you'll be left perturbed, not in peace. Yeah? But when you come for confession, God uses the priest as his mouthpiece to speak the words of forgiveness on his behalf. So remember, it's not the priest forgiving you, it is God forgiving you. Using the priest as his instrument to pronounce the words of absolution. So you get to hear with your own ears that your sins are forgiven. And you have no need to doubt about it. If you have gone to the confession, prepared yourself well, you have not tried to lie to the priest, you have spoken everything as it is, you have confessed sincerely, the priest will ask you to say the act of contrition and you say it. Uh, whether you know or do not know, the priest will help you sometimes because they'll sometimes if you panic, don't know what happened, forgotten. Yeah? And it's an important part of the confession also, uh, the act of contrition. There's a next point, I'll come to that. And you will hear the words of absolution. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, da, 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 da. Okay? Yen, the priest will say your sins are forgiven. So this will give us that assurance. This is the benefit. Of course, the so-called disadvantage has more to do with our own pride. Lah. And that is, we might be ashamed to tell our sins to another human being. Right? Normally, we commit sins. Some are quite shameful. And we are ashamed about it. So we don't like to tell people. So some have this hurdle. And will say, why should I tell my sin to the priest? Or I'm afraid to tell to the priest. The priest might scold me. By right, the priest should not scold you. Lah. That's not our job to scold you. And... That's the so-called disadvantage la, compared to confessing straight to God. But you know, this disadvantage helps us to grow in something. You know what is that? Humble acknowledgement of our real state of wretchedness, which we sometimes want to hide. Truly, you know, when you bear your soul open to another person, it is as though you are naked before that person, you know. And it can be, in fact, quite humiliating, but it's not the purpose of the sacrament but it can have this effect whereby we have to humble ourselves. So that process of humbling ourselves also has an additional benefit. Okay, anyway, don't worry, la. the priest is not there to judge you and to make you feel shameful, nothing. The priest is also a sinner. If you hear the sins of the priest also, I think you might blush. You know? And that's the beauty of it. God has chosen sinners to be the ones to hear the sins of others and in fact, since we are all sinners, 
Should I not have a compassionate heart towards you? Should I not know that you are weak, I am also weak? So why should I be so harsh to condemn you or to scold you in the confessional? There's no need. Because even I am a sinner before God, in need of His mercy. And you know, the priest also, even the Pope, he has to confess his sins. For the Pope, even more humiliating, he's the top man in the church, he will go to the least priest who will hear his sins, what he has done. Yeah? So we all have to go through those dynamics in actual fact. But know that the great advantage is that you get to hear from the lips of another person that your sins are forgiven. And that's something really wonderful. Okay? All right. Now, sorry, today's homily is a little bit long because there's another point now. Talking about the forgiveness of sins, actually, confession is not the only way we can receive the forgiveness of sins. I already mentioned you can even confess directly to God, moved by the Holy Spirit. You are really contrite. Sorry for your sins. In other words, you can be forgiven. Church does not say you cannot do that. Yeah? And, uh, but there is more than that. Do you know you receive forgiveness of sins also from the Holy Eucharist? Uh, listen today carefully to the prayer of consecration over the chalice especially. You will hear the words, forgiveness of sins. So whenever we receive the Holy Eucharist also, actually, God who is all holy is purifying us, sanctifying us. What does that mean? All your venial sins all washed away as you receive the Holy Eucharist. So, in fact, if you receive the Holy Eucharist, just, you know, you have your normal daily sins. There's no time for everybody to come for confession before Mass. Yeah? No matter how fast I, the priest is, how fast the penitents are, at most 10 people only in that short time. And yet, we have the I confess also. Maybe you are distracted at that point <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah? But... When you receive the Holy Eucharist, even without you saying sorry to God, the power of the Eucharist, Eucharist, the cleansing, sanctifying power of the Eucharist, all your sins also finished. And you leave this church actually spotless. You leave this church spotless. Of course, just one minute later, you might quarrel with someone in the car park, that's your problem. But actually, <laughs> actually yeah, you know, sin comes in and out of our life just like that. You know? But in actual fact, after you have received the Holy Communion, you are a holy, spotless Lamb of God. Wonderful, isn't it? Did you all know that? Do you all believe that? Hmm. Not so certain. Okay, never mind. Okay then. Now, and again, that's not the only way. Through the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, there also, the sick person receives the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, so... God has provided so many ways and means for us to be freed from our sins. And this is His great mercy. So great is His love for us. He has provided so many possible ways for us to be reconciled with Him. Yeah, so many that I've mentioned. And in fact, the one more thing that I forgot to mention yesterday when I gave the homily, but today I'll mention, even charity, doing works of almsgiving, doing acts of kindness to people, charity, the Bible says, covers a multitude of sins. Yeah? And you will not be doing charity if you do not love God. Yeah? So that love of God also, that expresses itself in charity, also covers our sins. So it brings also that forgiveness that we are looking for. Alright, so, now, I mentioned something about contrition. There is one time when or one situation in which the sacrament of confession is kind of like stuck, it doesn't work. You know when is that? It is when we go and confess our sins, but we have no contrition. In other words, we are not actually sorry for our sin. We don't intend to repent, and we don't intend to change even, over a, turn over a new leaf. But we are going because maybe... It's the thing the Catholics are doing. I'm a Catholic. I'm supposed to do, so I go. But actually, in my mind and heart, I know I'm not going to change. I don't intend to change. And I'm not really sorry for what I've done. That bugger deserved whatever happened to him. <laughs> whatever it is. If you go to confession with that kind of an attitude, it means you have no contrition. So even if the priest says, I absolve you from your sins, know that the sacrament has not taken place. Because you did not 
confess your sins with a contrite heart. So you went through a ritual, but you didn't celebrate the sacrament. Okay, of course the priest can't know lah, whether you are there, you know, really sincerely, honestly, uh, sorry for your sins or not. And actually, you only need to be 0.01% sorry is enough already for the sacrament. <laughs> but if you are 0.000 infinity, not sorry, then there is no forgiveness in actual fact. So important thing is we must really be sorry for our sins. Yeah, that contrition. That is why important aspect of the sacrament of confession, the priest will say, now say the act of contrition. It is to ensure that you have some contrition because that is an essential element of the sacrament. Okay? So contrition. So if you have no contrition, then actually nothing happens. In fact, you are, st you are not at rights with God. And actually, you, will, you yourself will know that if you approach the sacrament in that manner. And sometimes it happens because maybe your wife forced you and you're like, actually, I got no sin. Why am I here? <laughs> your parents forced you to go for confession. Anything that happens under force, it's sort of like null, no use. Because the person's heart is not there. So how is God going to speak to the heart of the person when the heart is not there? Right? So no, that's the only time when the confession does not work. And sometimes when the priest sees this, they will actually not grant the absolution. Maybe even might tell the penitent, well, if you are not here because you really want to confess your own sins, then maybe come another day. Go and pray about it and examine your conscience. And when you are ready, you come for confession. Okay? So sometimes it can happen that the priest will say, okay, come again another day because uh, actually you didn't want to be here today. Yeah? So never mind, it's okay. We'll give a little blessing, pray over them, that they will receive the grace of repentance. Yeah? Not scolding them, huh? but gently being patient, just as God is patient with us. Right? That we learn from the second reading. So the priest also is supposed to be very patient with the penitents. And we also must be patient with ourselves because sometimes it's really hard to turn back to God. Okay. Now, oh, I think there's one more point, but I shall spare you. Never mind. <laughs> Go and look up something about perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. So what is this? Perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. Go and Google it. You'll find out what it is. Yeah? Okay. We'll leave that for some other time, perhaps.